thy kingdom come. Last week I talked about hope in our personal lives, about how our prayer expresses our hope, trust and confidence in God who has our life story in his hands. Now this week I want to move on to a wider stage to ask not only about my future, but about our future, the future of our children. I want to move from biography, the story of individual lives, to history, the story of whole societies. What hope can there be in a world of disease and famine, and above all, in a world of war, of nuclear war? There are, of course, people who say that Christians, as Christians, especially Christian ministers and priests, should have no concern for these things. There are people who think that, say, Bishop Tutu in South Africa should attend to the services in his cathedral and leave social and political matters to the politicians who understand them. As church people, they say, we should get on with the business of praying and praising God. If we do have views about political and economic matters, it's nothing to do with our Christianity. It's because we lay claim to some kind of secular expertise. There are experts who have studied these things and know how to work out solutions to our problems. The trouble with this line of talk is that the only God that we pray to and worship says he's very much concerned with economic matters. He says he is the God of the poor. He says he's the God of righteousness and that means taking sides with the helpless and the downtrodden, with the widow and the orphan, against their oppressors. The God who meets us in the Bible and ultimately meets us in Jesus of Nazareth tells us that we can't be with him, we can't honestly worship him or speak truly about him unless we are in solidarity with the poor nor can we solve any of the world's real problems. Without this commitment to the poor, no amount of expertise will be of the slightest use, quite the contrary. It's not as though we were simply faced with a series of natural disasters like earthquakes and droughts. Most of our troubles are man-made. And even when they're unavoidable accidents, they're made far worse by what men do or what they don't do. Nuclear war was invented by experts. Poverty is ultimately man-made. Even famine is man-made. We all know the earth can produce enough food and more than enough food to feed everyone on earth. We have famine in the midst of plenty because we've devised a way of living that keeps the food supply away from those who need it. Famine is not a shortage of food, it's a shortage of justice. And in the Bible, that means a shortage of concern for the poor. Of course, it's not that there are wicked men who want people to die of starvation. And nobody, or very few people, actually want children to be slowly burnt alive with phosphorus jelly clinging to their skin. But chemical companies do make profit from making napalm. Not many people want even their worst enemies to die the hideous deaths that come from nuclear fallout. But all the same, these are not natural disasters. They happen because of what people want. These things don't happen because because people are ill-informed or stupid. They happen because we want to grab for ourselves and we don't even think of the consequences for others until it's too late. There are even those who think that organized greed is and should be the motive force of society. That unless people are intelligently greedy, there will be no progress. And by progress, they mean people, some people, getting richer. But this turns out to be accompanied 
by a vast number of people being hungry and poor. It's accompanied by regimes of oppression and torture. It's accompanied by wars in which 20 million people have died since what we strangely call the last war. When these accompanying horrors are noticed, it's thought we have on our hands some complex technical problem that the experts will solve and leave everything else as it is. If the world invites us to despair, it's not because of a conspiracy of especially evil people, though I think there are especially evil people. It's certainly not because of some incomprehensibly evil men in the Kremlin, or in the Pentagon, or even in the Vatican. It's mainly because of the accumulation and interdependence of many small failures, failures of generosity and of courage. It is just a fact that my minor self-indulgences, my unthinking cruelties, my doctoring of the truth, does link up with and reinforce the injustice of the world. If the world invites us to despair, it's largely because of our ordinary, undramatic selfishness. But it's also true that if we are invited to hope, it's because of a human thing too. It's because of the human life, death, resurrection, and presence of Jesus Christ. It's because of the power of this man Christ in us, because of the power of the Spirit, that we shall overcome the world. Now, don't imagine that I'm trying to make you all feel guilty for the sin of the world. Not at all. We've been rescued from such guilt and slavery to sin. That's the redemption that Christ won for us on the cross by his loving obedience to his Father's will. Our trouble is that having been rescued from the sin of the world, having escaped from guilt and slavery, we now have a task. We have a fight on our hands. Sure, we're no longer hopeless or helpless slaves of sin, but our old slave master is now our enemy. An enemy that in the power of the spirit we have to fight. We have to be engaged in a struggle. See, for most of us, it's not that we've gone over to the enemy, though that can happen. It's just that we don't fight hard enough. And that fight is above all the struggle on behalf of Christ's poor, on behalf of the oppressed, the helpless. They say Christian preachers should not play at politics. I say we don't have to. There are plenty of Christians who have no interest at all in politics. But if their Christianity is real, the politicians are going to have to be interested in them. Nobody nowadays anymore thinks that Jesus was a political activist concerned with political power. But the people who did have political power, the temple priesthood and the Roman colonial authorities, they were very much concerned about him. They knew he was a threat. They had him crucified because he was a threat. Don't imagine that when the world sees how Christians love one another, it will be lost in admiration. When it sees how these Christians love one another, the world usually goes for its gun. As Jesus promised, the world will hate you. I'm talking, of course, of real love that expresses itself in action, not in inane cheerfulness or feeling of benevolence. Of course, every society is some attempt by human beings to live together in friendship, in cooperation. And to this extent, it's a good and God-given thing. The trouble is that we build friendship with some at the expense of others. The democracy of Athens floated on a sea of slaves. The wealthy make a society in which there is a kind of friendship and cooperation. That's a society from which the poor are excluded. That's where they are poor. And because they are excluded, they have to be kept down, kept in their place by fear, by lies, by force. 
the precarious stability of civilization as we know it would be profoundly threatened by a serious outbreak of love. This is the threat posed almost unconsciously and sometimes quite reluctantly by the Christian movement. Because Christians, whatever their peculiar political prejudices, they, whatever they may have in that way, in the end simply can't swallow the idea that some groups of people are less human, less fit for human society than others. In the end, and it may take them a very long time to get to the end, but in the end, their deep conviction is that people matter because they are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. That they're all, without exception, called to be children of God in Christ. And this means that however we may twist and turn to keep in with the people in power, however hard the churches may even try to sell out to the wealthy and their agents, to collude with the oppressors of the poor, it can't be done for long. In the end, the church lives by the Holy Spirit, and the gates of hell can't indefinitely prevail. For this we have nowadays, of course, the testimony of the men of power themselves. Throughout the world, whether it's the businessmen and military dictators of Latin America, or the bureaucrats of Eastern Europe, they all agree that the major internal threat to their power comes not from terrorists or political subversives, but from those churches that have recovered their Christianity, that have returned to the gospel. Those who have remembered that the church is just humankind being drawn towards the kingdom, and that the kingdom belongs to the poor. It's these churches that are especially hated by the powers of this world. That's why the Christian hope that we celebrate in Advent is not optimism. Well, of course we don't believe in the superstition of inevitable progress. Just mean, that just means that some people will get richer while the world becomes a more fearful and more fearsome place. But we also don't optimistically imagine that the way forward could be simple for men of goodwill. What we have is not optimism, but hope. We do believe that humankind can and will, by the power of the Spirit, become not ever wealthier, but more richly human, less frightened, more free, more secure in the peace that comes from justice and friendship but only through overcoming the world in Christ. We can move to a society, to a world, which, while not itself, of course, the kingdom of God, would be on the way to it, would be our best available picture of it. We're not optimistic about the prospect for such a world. We don't have the illusion that justice and peace can be established if only we can find the right technique. We know that quite small attempts to bring about justice, quite small movements of opposition to genocide, to racism, to war and exploitation, meet with blank hostility, first with suspicion and then with persecution. There are large parts of the world where really to make an option for the poor is to invite the death squads and the torture chambers of the police. And there are other parts of the world where things have not come to such extremes. We are not optimists. We don't present a lovely vision of the world which everyone is expected to fall in love with. We simply have, wherever we are, some small local task to do on the side of justice, on the side of the poor. This, in the power of the spirit, we will try to do. And we know that to do it, is to risk hostility and persecution as Jesus risked crucifixion. It is to risk defeat. And that's what we mean by hope. Because our hope is the kind that goes through defeat and crucifixion to resurrection. We know that we shall sometimes have to fail. 
we have to fail rather than betray the very justice that we struggle for. We shall have to fail rather than use the weapons of the oppressor against him. But we can do this because we have hope. Because we know that God will bring life out of such defeat and failure as he brought life out of the tomb of Jesus.